My name is Russ Miller of Creation, Evolution, and Science Ministries. I live in Flagstaff, Arizona. And tonight we're going to talk about a pre-flood world theory and Noah's Ark of all things. Why Noah's Ark? Well, Jesus refers to the Ark as a historical fact. Therefore, if someone doesn't believe in Noah's Ark, it's, good, it's easy for a scoffer to take them to where Jesus refers to the Ark as a fact and weaken their faith in the Lord Jesus. Why are we going to look at a pre-flood theory? Well, I want to open up people's minds to how awesome heaven is going to be. The Bible indicates that heaven will be beyond our wildest imaginations. It's going to be better than anything we could imagine. That means if we had a big chalkboard and we start throwing out ideas about how awesome heaven's going to be, we won't even come close to describing it. It will be beyond our imaginations. And I think the pre-flood world was really beyond our comprehension as well. So we're going to look at a pre-flood theory. I want you to realize it's just a theory. It's, the pre-flood world is gone. It was destroyed in the flood. And it's not there to test, study, and observe today. And there are actually several good theories on what the pre-flood world may have looked like. This is just one of several theories. But the Bible is not a theory. The Bible is given to us by the inspired Word of God. In fact, the Bible tells us that all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. That means word for word and cover to cover. That means we can read the Bible and we can believe what the Bible says. Where it's written to be taken as figurative speech, it makes it very clear in the context. And where it's written to be historical, it makes it clear there as well. Some of that historical accuracy is found in Exodus 20, verse 11. In the middle of the Ten Commandments, we're told, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the seas, and all that in them is. That's a six-day creation. In Genesis, we're also told that God made the firmament and divided the waters that were under the firmament from the waters that were above the firmament. So there was water above and below the firmament in the original creation. So there's a lot of speculation about what was that firmament. Well, some folks say it was the land. It divides the waters, but that would be side to side, not above and below. So let's keep reading. We're told that fowl, birds, that fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. Well, birds fly in our atmosphere, correct? So evidently, this first firmament is our atmosphere, where the birds fly. Now, some people think, and this is where we're going to go into a theory, that there may have been some sort of a water vapor or ice canopy above the atmosphere in the original creation. So this is called the canopy theory. There are some various versions, and there are some very knowledgeable creation scientists that believe in the canopy theory, and there are some that have other theories that they prefer over the canopy theory. So I don't know that this is how God did this, but let's look at this theory because it ex does tend to explain a lot of potential pre-flood conditions. Water vapor only weighs 62% as much as dry air, so this is feasible. A vapor canopy or an ice canopy would have done a lot of neat things. They would have blocked out a lot of the X-rays and the UV radiation and gamma rays. A lot of the things that cause entropy and cancers on Earth today would have been blocked out yet it would have allowed visible light to come through to be seen for signs of the seasons and such. This canopy could have also created a worldwide hyperbaric effect and a worldwide greenhouse effect. Let's take a look at these two potential effects. This is a hyperbaric oxygen chamber. They're used in hospitals around the globe because by greatly increasing oxygen pressure, they greatly reduce the amount of time it takes to heal up from injuries or surgeries. It's, in fact, many professional teams and athletes themselves have their own hyperbaric chambers these days. Well, is there any evidence found in Earth that might support us having had greater oxygen pressure in the past? Well, this is a piece of amber, which is petrified tree sap. If you ever saw the movie Jurassic Park, the mosquito that was supposedly trapped in amber and they revived its blood and DNA in the blood and made dinosaurs, that would not likely happen because DNA breaks down very quickly. However, they do find pockets of air trapped in amber. And scientific studies on those pockets of air reveal that the Earth used to have as much as 50% greater oxygen content than we have today. So that would 
per, that per, would provide some proof or substance to the pre-flood conditions. Now, in a hyperbaric oxygen condition, your blood plasma would become oxygen saturated. In other words, you could run for a couple of hundred miles before you started to get tired. That would be pretty awesome, wouldn't it? You wouldn't even have to drive your car. You could just run over here. That's probably the reason Adam and Eve didn't have cars. They could just run over to their grandparents' house. Well, except, of course, they didn't have grandparents. Well, what about the greenhouse effect? Had there been some sort of a canopy, you could have had a greenhouse effect around the entire globe. You would have had spring-like temperatures from the North Pole to the South Pole 365 days a year. Well, you've seen how plants grow during the springtime, correct? It would have been springtime every day. Is there any evidence, though, to support warm temperatures around the globe? How could that be possible? Well, actually, scientists have discovered dinosaur fossils in Antarctica. Well, dinosaurs have to eat hundreds of pounds of fresh vegetation per day. This from New Geology. Coal layers in the Arctic Circle uniformly testify that a warm climate has in former times prevailed over the whole globe. At one time in the past, things were totally different than what we see today. Plant growth in a pre-flood world such as this would have been phenomenal. Dr. Komori in Japan did an experiment to imitate these pre-flood conditions. He raised cherry tomato plants, but the, he put them in a greenhouse to filter out the UV light and gamma rays, and he pressurized CO2 and applied it to the stem of the plants to imitate that hyperbaric condition. After two years, one plant was more than 16 feet tall and produced more than 900 tomatoes. After 10 years, the plant was more than 30 feet tall and had produced more than 10,000 tomatoes. But they weren't your normal cherry tomatoes. They were almost the size of baseballs. I think the original creation, the pre-flood world, was beyond our comprehension. In fact, the Bible says the average lifespan in the pre-flood world was 912 years. Well, goodness, that means we'd all just be children still. Now, skeptics, and those are people who don't believe what the Bible says. Think about this. If you read the Bible, but you, I don't accept that, that makes you a skeptic. So you might want to give it some thought. But skeptics aren't going to believe this, and they're going to say, well, the Bible doesn't mean 912 years. It means 912 months. Now, let me see if I've got this correct. A year means a month, and a day means billions of years, and pretty soon I don't know what to believe if I don't just read God's word and believe what he tells me. If each year is really a month, it causes a lot of problems for the Word of God. Enoch beget Methuselah when he was 65. If each year is really a month, that means he wasn't even five and a half years old at the time. That just doesn't work. I was in Texas a few years ago, and they were running some experiments on hyperbaric chambers, and they put some fruit flies in the chambers. I was there on day 18. These guys usually only live three days. I was there on day 18. They were going strong. That was over a 500% increase in their lifespans. Now, the word Methuselah should be of interest to us because Methuselah means his death shall bring, or when he dies, it shall be sent. It was interesting because it was in the year that Methuselah died that the flood waters burst forth upon the earth. If you look at the Hebrew translations of the root words in the Genesis 5 genealogies, what you'll find is Adam's name means man, and Noah's name comes out to comfort or rest. In fact, if you look at the Hebrew translations of the root words throughout the genealogical records in Genesis 5, they read, man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching. His death shall bring the despairing comfort or rest. And there's the gospel message hidden in the first book of the Jewish Torah. Wow. There's no way mankind could have penned the Bible without being inspired by God. Well, we talked about the water above the firmament. What about the water below the firmament? The Bible says that God stretched out the earth above the waters. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. 
You see, in the original creation, there was evidently these great underground watering systems, the fountains of the deep. That's what burst forth to create the floodwaters. But they sent up a mist and watered the whole face of the ground every day so it didn't have to rain. So why did God destroy this awesome creation that may have had a hyperbaric chamber effect and worldwide spring-like temperatures and underground watering systems and lush forests from the North Pole to the South Pole? Why did God destroy his original creation? Well, we're told that in Genesis also. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and the Lord said, I will destroy man. It repents me, I have made them. And he spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Most people seem to think there were two people on Noah's ark. There were eight people on board Noah's ark. Noah and his wife, his three sons, and three daughter-in-laws. The Greek word for the flood of Noah's day was cataclysmos, from which we derive the word cataclysmic. Cataclysmos is only used four times in Scripture, always referring to the worldwide cataclysmic judgment by water in the days of Noah. Some folks like to say, well, come on, Russ, if there had been a global flood, don't you think there would be some flood legends floating about? Did you know that more than 300 ancient flood legends have been found? Almost every ancient civilization at its beginning has an account of just a handful of people surviving a global flood and repopulating the world. In fact, legends from the world's oldest civilizations like Babylon, India, Egypt, China, include a world that was ended by flood during the 10th generation of people which should be of interest because according to the chronological records found in Scripture, the flood took place about 1,656 years after creation during the 10th generation of people. Historical records support exactly what God's Word has to say. In fact, the ancient Chinese had a legend called the Story of Fu Hai, who they considered to be the father of their civilization. The ancient Chinese legend goes that Fu Hai, his wife, three sons, and three daughters survived a worldwide flood in a boat and repopulated the world. Sounds almost exactly like the biblical account. So why, doesn't it, why isn't it exactly like the biblical account? In fact, why aren't all 300 or so legends exactly like the account found in, in Genesis? Well, because at the Tower of Babel, people's languages were confused, and they had to divide up by nations and spread about around the globe. They took with them the original account, which you can still find in the book of Genesis. But after being handed down generation to generation for 4,000 years, some changes have been made in the various accounts. It would be like if I whispered in the first young man's ear a secret and it went around the room. By the time it came back to me, there are going to be some changes to it. But if you want to see the original account, just read the book of Genesis. So a fair question might be, well, come on, how did Noah collect all those animals from all over the world. Well, I've got to tell you, I don't think he could have collected animals from all around the world, which is why God brought the animals to Noah. Two of every sort shall come unto thee, seven of the clean types. Well, how did Noah fit all those millions of animals on board the ark? Well, let's get a feel for how many animals may have been on board that boat. The Bible indicates he only had to bring land-dwelling creatures that breathe through their nostrils. This would eliminate all sorts of critters, such as insects that breathe through spiracles in their skin or anything that doesn't live on land and breathe through nostrils. There wouldn't have been fish or whales or porpoises on board the ark. Also, he only had to bring two of every kind, not two of every variety. Ten times in the book of Genesis, we're told that plants and or animals will bring forth after their kind. This is called micro-adaptations, and you can show millions of scientific ex examples of kinds bringing forth after their kind. So Noah didn't have to take all 300-plus types of dogs we have today on the ark. He most likely brought a pair of dogs. Mutts work the best. They have the widest gene pool. And then through adaptations, which are caused by the sorting or loss of genetic information, they would have brought forth dogs after their kind and repopulated the world with dogs following the flood. Let's get a feel for how many passengers may have been on board that ark. 
There are roughly 2 million classified species today. Only about 40,000 are vertebrates. If you take out the marine creatures and the amphibians and the water-dwelling mammals, you're left with about 6,000 kinds. Two of each kind is 12,000. Throw in seven of the clains, and we're looking at somewhere around 13,000 animals on board that boat. And the average size of a land mammal that breathes through his nostrils is the size of a house cat. So the real question is how did Noah fit 13,000 house cat size animals on board that ark? Well, I think of the few really large types, such as elephants or giraffes or dinosaurs, God might have brought juveniles to him. I mean, they were smaller, they weighed less, they live longer when they get off the ark to repopulate the world. Am I saying that dinosaurs were on board Noah's ark just about 4,400 years ago? Oh, absolutely. Two of every kind shall be brought unto thee to keep alive. What's the first line we read to our children in a dinosaur book? 65 million years ago, dinosaurs went extinct. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Who saw dinosaurs go extinct 65 million years ago? Nobody. That's a religious belief. And you've just taught your children that death existed for millions of years before man. Well, the problem is later on you try to tell that same child that by one man sin entered the world and death because of man's sin and the child's scratching their head thinking, well, wait, Mom, wait, Dad, you've been reading me dinosaur books since I was a Little tot telling me that death existed for millions of years before man came along. How could man sin have brought death in the world and separated us from God, requiring Jesus to die on a cross? You see the problem? Very subtle and very damaging. No wonder the Bible says, teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies. Did you know that the Bible says, don't give heed to endless genealogies, which minister to questions rather than godly edifying? Let me ask you a question. How many of you truly believe that dinosaurs lived with man in the last few, let's say last thousand to two thousand years? How many of you actually believe that? About half of you. That, that's good. Usually when I ask that question, only about one out of a hundred people raise their hand. When I ask it at the start, that is. But the Bible says, he that answers a matter before he hears it, it's a folly and a shame to him. In other words, let's open up our minds, let's look at some evidence, and then let's decide what we want to believe. So, how do dinosaurs fit in to a biblical young earth creation? Keep in mind the Bible says man and beast were both made on day six. And by the way, that's a picture of my wife, Joanna. She's the pretty one with the white blouse on, in case you were wondering. Think about this. First of all, the word dinosaur was only invented in 1841. Prior to that, they were called dragons or serpents. Here's a 1946 dictionary. Under dragon today, you'll be told a mythical creature. Here's a dictionary not even 70 years old, and it says, under dragon, now rare, a huge serpent, a fabulous animal. Go over to, to a library that keeps old books and look at the dictionaries that are 200 years old and look under the word dragon. There won't be anything mythical about them at all a couple hundred years ago. The ancient history books are full of thousands of legends of man and various types of dragons, which their descriptions sound much like various dinosaurs we find their bones of today. Let me give you three examples of these stories. These all emanate from India. Alexander the Great, when his, con when his soldiers conquered what is now India 2,300 years ago, wrote that his soldiers were scared by the great dragons that lived in caves there. 2,300 years ago. 2,000 years ago, Pliny the Elder, a Roman historian, wrote that the elephants in India are constantly at war with the dragons. 2,000 years ago. 1,900 years ago, Apollonius of Tyana wrote, the whole of India is girt with enormous dragons, killers of elephants. 1,900 years ago. There was nothing mythical about dragons 1,900 years ago. In fact, Marco Polo, just 750 years ago, when he visited China, wrote of the dragons that the emperor raised to pull chariots in parades. 
Now around the globe, we find cave drawings and hieroglyphs of various types of dinosaurs. And we're told that these drawings are anywhere from 800 years old to 2,000 years old. Well, we didn't discover dinosaur bones until about 185 years ago. How did they know what they looked like 800 years ago or 2,000 years ago? Unless somebody saw them? The city of Nurlu, France had been named in honor of a dragon slain there. They said it was attacking the people of the city, so they had to go out and kill it. And they said it was bigger than an ox and had long, sharp, pointed horns on its head. It sounds sort of like a triceratops, doesn't it? God's describing a dinosaur, I believe, to Job in Job 40.15, where he says to Job, Behold now, behemoth, behemoth, one of the largest of his creations, which I made with thee. We were both made on day six. He eats grass like an ox. Well, some well-meaning theologians who have been taught that dinosaurs have been extinct for millions of years tried to explain away behemoth by saying, well, maybe that's an elephant or a hippo. So let's read further. His strengths are in his loins, and the force is in the navel of his belly. Strengths in his loins and belly? Well, elephants and hippos, they do have big bellies. Maybe that is behemoth. This guy, he's got a big belly. <laughs> Maybe that's behemoth. What do you think? <clears throat> well, I think this is the big belly God's describing. He had to have the strengths in his loins and belly to balance that huge, heavy tail and huge, heavy neck and head. Reading further, we're told he moves his tail like a cedar. Well, that's certainly not a tail like a cedar tree. <laughs> cedar stump, perhaps. But there's a tail that's like a cedar tree. I think God's describing a, an Apatosaurus-type creature, a dinosaur. But reading further, we're told he is the chief of the ways of God. And by very, the very definition, that means the largest of God's creatures. And sauropods are the largest known animals ever to have lived. And I think that fits the description found in Job to a T. And I also think that God deserves a credit for his created beings, not Satan. But dinosaurs have been gone for 65 million years, so nobody ever could have seen one, right? Well, don't tell these guys in Monterey, California in 1925 this Critter was seen fighting with seals in the bay the day before and washed up on the beach dead the next morning. It was studied and deemed to be a plesiosaur. It had a 20-foot-long neck. T-Rex blood has been found in dinosaur bones. Back in 1992, a team of evolutionary believing scientists found an unfossilized T-Rex leg bone. Now, unfossilized dinosaur bones are found quite often. Dozens and dozens have been found, which makes you wonder how could they have laid there for millions of years without rotting away. But what was especially unusual about this particular bone was that it had red blood cells inside of it. And scientists admit that red blood cells couldn't last but a few thousand years at the most. So these scientists spent the last 17 or so years trying to refute their own finding. And they've been unable to do so. It got worse for them about two years ago because scientists found more unfossilized dinosaur bones that not only had red blood cells in them, but soft, flexible tissues. And there is no way those could have laid there for millions and millions of years. It got much worse for them in the past year. They have found more than a dozen other dinosaur bones with soft tissues and red blood cells in them. And scientists admit these couldn't have laid there for more than a few thousand years at the most. The reason that we find these dinosaur bones with the tissues and the red blood cells is that those layers were laid down in a global flood about 4,400 years ago, just like the Bible says. But here's a uh, cartoon, a letter, or a, a uh, editorial cartoon trying to make fun of folks that believe in a young earth creation, calling us simple-minded. It's kind of a cute little cartoon here. And uh, basically, I guess what I would say is name-calling is the last bastion for those who have no evidence to support their religious belief, which is starting to crumble all around them. 
cute little sign here says, this way to the flat earth society, meaning if you believe the Bible, you must still believe the earth is flat. Actually, it was science that used to teach the earth was flat. The Bible has always told us that God sits upon the circle of the earth. Anyone who actually read their Bible has always known that the Bible was a sphere. And 2,000 years after that verse was written, science caught up and proved that the earth is indeed a sphere. Let me ask you another question. How many of you now believe that dinosaurs and man were both made on day six and lived together recently in the past? How many of you can believe that? Absolutely. Absolutely. You'd have to deny the overwhelming evidence to say anything other. Now, let me ask you a more difficult question. How many of you believe that fire-breathing dinosaurs lived with man in the recent past? Wow, that's a lot. That's a lot. Usually nobody raises their hand to that. You, you guys really are crazy. <laughs> Here's the problem if we don't believe that fire-breathing dragons lived with mankind. God himself, while talking to Job, tells Job of Leviathan, none is so fierce, a flame goeth out of his mouth. God says that fire-breathing critters lived with man in the recent past. Well, is there a viable theory to explain fire-breathing animals? Since we don't have any to test, study, and observe today, all we could do is make up a theory. Well, this is the bombardier beetle. Now, when threatened, he sprays his attacker with a chemical that is the boiling point of water, 212 degrees Fahrenheit. The bombardier has twin chambers that store two volatile chemicals apart from one another because if they came together, kaboom, that would be the end of the bombardier beetle, which is a problem for gradual evolution, by the way, but we won't go there right now. Now, when he's threatened, the chemicals go from the storage chambers to combustion tubes where enzymes are added, producing a noxious chemical that is the boiling point of water. This takes place in about a hundredth of a second. How long does it take you to boil water? A lot longer than that, right? And he has the apparatus and controls to spray this in a 360-degree pattern and hit his attacker right between the eyes. So what does that have to do with fire-breathing animals? Well, how about this as a viable theory? This is Parasaurolophus. Notice the huge crest on top of his head. The huge crest contains a complex series of tubes and passages. Well, perhaps these were storage and combustion tubes that stored volatile chemicals apart from one another. And perhaps when he was threatened, those chemicals went from the storage tubes to combustion chambers where enzymes were added. And perhaps when he breathed them out and they hit oxygen, maybe a flame went out of his mouth. It's just a theory. He's, it's not there to test, study, and observe today. But let me ask you a question. How many of you can believe, just like God told Job, that Fire-breathing animals lived with man in the recent past. How many of us can, can accept God's word on that? Absolutely. And the real important point is that even if we don't know how God does things, because he doesn't tell us exactly how he does everything, we can still put our faith in his word. We can still believe that he's done what he said he has done, word for word and cover to cover. Let me ask you guys something else. Do you think it was terrifying to live with dinosaurs? Absolutely. <laughs> Do you think they just considered us to be fast food? Maybe not quite fast enough food? Well, the answer actually is no. You see, in the original creation, dinosaurs didn't eat people. Well, how do I know that? Well, we're told in the book of Genesis, to every beast I have given every green herb for meat. Evidently, everything in the original creation was vegetarian. Plants were made as food sources. There was no death, evil, or suffering in the original creation. It wasn't until Noah and his family got off of the ark after the flood that God told them that every moving thing that lives shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. It's perfectly okay to kill and eat meat today, but we are to receive it with thanksgiving to our biblical creator. But it wasn't okay in the pre-flood world. After the fall of man, I don't know that it stayed that way, but God's original creation had no death, evil, or suffering in it. You know, scientists might find this skull and say that's a skull of a ferocious meat eater, long, sharp canines for gripping and tearing meat, but actually that's the skull of a panda bear who's 100% vegetarian. In fact, T. rex teeth have been found with chlorophyll stains in the cracks of the teeth, and chlorophyll 
comes from plants. The Bible says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and there shall be no more death, sorrow, or pain. In other words, the new heavens and the new earth that we'll have when Jesus returns is going to be beyond our imagination, and there'll be no more death, evil, or pain, or suffering in there. So I like to tell folks, if you like to fish or eat salmon or chicken or hunt deer, you need to get it in now. <laughs> because it's not going to be that way in the new heavens and the new earth. We'll return to being vegetarian again. You know, a fair question is, what caused dinosaurs to become extinct? Since we discovered their bones about 185, 190 years ago, there have been about 2,000 different theories. And actually, one of the more popular over the past 30 years was that a meteor struck the planet, caused a dust cloud and a blackout. The plants died, the animals died. But there's really virtually no evidence of this meteor strike. And it's lost a lot of its standing over the last five years. This fellow says, I've got a new theory, a lack of oxygen. Not an asteroid killed the dinosaurs. He says an 80-foot-long Apatosaurus had nostrils the size of a horse, so he couldn't breathe. Well, we find their bones. I mean, they had to be able to breathe at one time, which actually supports the pre-flood conditions with the hyperbaric effect. They wouldn't have had a problem breathing at all in the original creation if they had that hyperbaric effect in it. I have a theory. I think that about 4,400 years ago, God judged man's sin with a global flood that killed everything on earth other than the few critters and people that were on board that ark, burying them in sedimentary layers of rock that were laid down by water to form today's fossils. Dinosaurs leaving the ark faced a new and a hostile world. They had lost all those neat pre-flood conditions. They now faced a world with deserts and oceans and winters and summers and ice caps, and a lot of them could not adjust, and they went extinct over the next few thousand years. Yet this week, millions of kids are going to be brainwashed that 65 million years ago, dinosaurs went extinct. That's based on those strata layers forming slowly and denying the global flood. Satan's seed is being planted. Whenever you hear anything that starts millions or billions of years ago, what you're really hearing is once upon a time, because a fairy tale is about to follow. Jesus said that the enemy that sowed them, the lies, is the devil, and the harvest will be the end of the world. Let's get back to that ark. How big was that ark to get those 13,000 house cat-sized critters on board? Well, in Genesis, we're told that the length was 300 cubits and the width was 50 cubits. Well, what in the world is a cubit? It was also three stories tall. Well, today, a lot of folks say a cubit is 18 inches, but they didn't have rulers in. A cubit was the tip of your elbow to the tip of your middle finger. Now, my cubit's about 20 inches long. Using my cubit, the ark would have been 500 feet long and 85 feet across and three stories tall. If you ever have a picnic out in a park, you should get four people and mark off 500 feet by 85 feet. The ark was huge. And that's big enough to hold about 350,000 cat-sized critters. They didn't need that much room. What was the extra room for? I'm just going to speculate that, remember, God offers salvation to everybody. Anyone could have got on board that ark. Now, God knew who was going to get on and not get on the ark, but I, perhaps that extra room was just to offer salvation to everybody. Well, some folks that are skeptics will say they couldn't have built such a big boat. Well, here's a picture of a giant Roman ship that was built in 100 B.C. There's a man circled in red at the front to give you some scale. Records show that the Greeks had a warship in 300 B.C. that was more than 500 feet long, eight levels tall, and contained 1,600 oarmen. So they did have the technology. Even if they did not have the technology, remember that God told Noah how to build the ark and what to build it from. It didn't matter if mankind could make big boats or not. Also, the Bible says that there were giants in the earth in those days, those pre-flood days. Talking about the Nephilim, in fact, Og was the king of Bashan. He was Goliath's king. His bed was made of iron, and using my cubit, it was 16 feet long and 7 feet wide. This is from a Wisconsin newspaper in 1904. A race of giants lived here. Mounds were found containing hundreds of skeletons. One skull was three times the size of the ordinary human. 
other bones were correspondingly as big. Mankind's gene pool has the data to produce huge humans. Look at some of the NBA players. So why aren't giant human bones on dis prominent displays at museums around the world? Well, because that goes against the fairy tale of Darwinian evolution, which says things are evolving bigger and better. Despite all the science, it says just the opposite. Things are getting worse and worse. Have you ever heard the term prehistoric animal? Did you know that there's really no such word as prehistoric? The correct word is pre-flood animal. Giant critters are found throughout the various strata layers, and they're an embarrassment to evolutionists. So they call them prehistoric and shovel them off to the side like they don't count. But they do count. Here's an 1860 Webster's Dictionary. There's no word prehistoric in there. Scientists at John Hopkins have found a growth gene in mice that will cause mice to grow three times their normal size when it's activated. How would you like to have those mice around your house? <laughs> Pre-flood critters include this rhino, rebuilt from its bones at the University of Nebraska Museum. It's 18 feet tall at the shoulders. We don't have rhinos like that today. And the centipede was found fossilized in Germany that was almost nine feet long. Could you imagine sitting around watching television one night and have him crawl out from under the couch? <laughs> Give you something to talk about for a while. Bats have been found fossilized that were the size of sheep with 15-foot wingspans. You couldn't go outside after dark with bats like that flying around, could you? <laughs> have you seen Uncle Bob? No, he went out after dark the other night. We said, don't go out there, Uncle Bob. He didn't listen to us. We think the bats got him. You know, fossils of grasshoppers that are two feet long, 18-inch long cockroaches, on and on we could go with these pre-flood critters. We're taught that fossils take millions of years to develop. Let me ask you a question. Who's ever seen a fossil form over millions of years? Nobody. That's a religious belief. Now, if I can show you just one example of something fossilizing in less than a million years, then I have scientifically refuted that teaching, correct? This is my favorite fossil to show people. This cowboy boot was made in 1950, according to the manufacturer. It was found fossilized just 30 years later. Is 30 years the same thing as millions of years? No, we've just refuted that false teaching. The sad but interesting thing is a poor cowboy's fossilized foot and ankle. It's inside of the boot. So why are textbooks still teaching that these things take millions of years to form? when we can scientifically show that it does not. Because millions of years is the magic ingredient for Darwinism. They have to have time beyond human comprehension to get you to believe that somehow you evolved all on your own without God being involved. Here's a pre-flood dragonfly. You think, big deal, I bounced one off the windshield of the car last summer. Well, not like this baby. He has a three-foot wingspan. If you hit him, him going 75 miles an hour down the highway, he's going to make a convertible out of your car right away. The pre-flood world was nothing like the post-curse world we live in today. Keep that in mind when we start thinking about heaven. When someone says to me, knowing his boys couldn't have built such a big boat, I just say, hey, you haven't seen them boys. I mean, the real question is, how big was Noah's cubit? I mean, how big was that ark? And how big were the animals on board that ark? There's a pre-flood turtle that's 15 feet long. And, you know, pre-flood sharks have been found that were more than 80 feet long. You ever see the movie Jaws? That shark was supposed to be about 21 feet long. You have to use him as bait to catch a pre-flood shark. In Hebrews 11, we're told, and listen to this carefully, by faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, and became the heir of righteousness, which is by what? By faith. We're supposed to have what? Faith. We are saved by faith. Think about Noah. He lives in a world where it probably hadn't even rained, and God tells him to build this humongous boat over more than a 100-year period, 500 plus feet long, 85 plus feet wide, three levels tall. He's going to put all these animals on board. And Noah, through nothing but pure faith in the word of God, followed those instructions and became the heir of righteousness, which is by faith. 
And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. And they went in as the Lord God had commanded them. Once again, following the word of God. And the Lord shut him in. And when the door of that ark shut, it was too late for anybody else to get on board. Do you know anyone could have gone up that narrow plank that went through that one door into the ark? Anyone could have got on board that ark and been safe from the flood in the hands of God. But only Noah and his family put their faith in God. The others did not and were literally dead in the water when the flood burst forth upon the earth. Jesus said that before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying right up until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Wow. Jesus just said that right before the, the flood, people were just eating and drinking and pretty much ignoring the word of God and having a good time and having parties. And the flood came and took them all away like this. And Jesus says just before his return, People are going to be eating and drinking and carrying on and having beer parties and football games and not going to church and ignoring the word of God. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, in the twinkling of an eye, Jesus is going to return. And at that point in time, it's going to be too late. You see, the time to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior was 10 years ago. And if you didn't do it then, it was a year ago. And if you didn't do it then, it was last week. And if you haven't done it yet, it's right now. Because we don't know when Jesus is going to return, but I suspect it's going to be sooner as opposed to later. In John, we're told that in the beginning was the Word, and all things were made by him. The Word is the Creator. The Creator is the Word of God. We're also told that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The Word of God, the Creator, is none other than our Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ. But Jesus also called himself the bread of life. So Jesus is the word, but Jesus is also the bread of life. But when tempted by Satan, Jesus answered Satan and said, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word from the mouth of God. And my friends, that means word for word and cover to cover. And that includes the first five words of Scripture, which are that in the beginning, God created. We can believe those five words and every word thereafter, word for word and cover to cover. Let me end this with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this evening and for your word. Your word who created us, your word who loves us and redeems us who suffered and died on a cross and was buried and rose again the third day so our sin could be forgiven. Dear Heavenly Father, thank, for your, thank you for your Son, Jesus. It is in his great name I do pray. Amen.